Yeah, IFA, you've probably heard and read a lot about Standard & Poor's long-running research series into active versus passive mutual fund performance. Commonly referred to by its acronym, SPIVA, this is one of our favorite research reports. What stands out about these reports are not only how consistently active fund managers lag their respective indexes, but also how well thought out and clean S&P Dow Jones indices research methodology has proved to be over time. And that's not something to take lightly. While it's true that scrubbing the noise from data relating to survivorship bias and style consistency has become the de facto standard in funds research these days, should be pointed out that long before such practices became common, S&P Dow Jones Indices was pioneering and setting a higher research bar for the entire industry through its SPIVA research. As a result, it's an honor to have with us today Craig Lazara, Managing Director in the Core Product Management Group at S&P Dow Jones Indices. Besides working at S&P, he has an extensive history in index and funds management that includes ex executive duties at Quantitative Research Group Abacus Analytics, Salman Smith Barney's Global Equity Index Group, Millen Bank, and T. Rowe Price, among others. Mr. Lazar is a graduate of Princeton University and Harvard Business School. Thank you very much today, Craig, for taking the time to speak to us. Thank you, Murray. I'm delighted to be here. I'd like to start with perhaps the most obvious question. Do you find a lot of investors are surprised at how consistently these speed for the scorecards are able to document such underwhelming performance by active managers? Uh, in, a, in a word, yes. Uh, I think... Uh, there's there's an assumption, at, which is encouraged, of course, by the active management community, uh, that people who try to outperform uh, an index ought to be able, at least on average, ought to be able to do it. And the data are very clear that that, that that's not true. But but you, you quite reliably uh, get that uh, get that reaction. It's particularly true. I mean, we're recording this on, on the first of February. Typically, early in the year, there will be at least one or two uh, uh, articles by an active manager saying, this is going to be the year. And I know last year wasn't, and the year before that wasn't. This is going to be the year uh, which uh, when active managers do well. And, and that, that's, been, that's been wrong for consistently for, for many years, but, but the hope, uh, hope and commercial interest uh, spring eternal. Yeah, and what's interesting, I think, is that it, you have several different um, versions of the SPIVA research and your persistent scorecard shows that not only long-term do active managers lag the indexes, but um, it's just overwhelming uh, in the short term too, when you would think they would have the biggest advantage. Yes. And there, there are a number of reasons for that. I mean, I can give you, you know, three quickly, and then we can obviously elaborate if you'd like. One, the obvious, the first one is cost, right? The indexing costs less than active management. Uh, the Investment Company oh. Institute, uh, most recent um, estimate, I think, was something on the order of uh, 65 basis points difference between the average actively managed U.S. equity fund and the average passively managed fund. So what that means is the average active manager starts 65 basis points in the hole. So that, that's the first thing. And, that, second, and that's a huge hurdle, isn't well, it? Yeah, that's a, that's a, I mean, 65, not so much in one year. You can compound that over 10 years. That's a lot of money. Uh, if that's all there, even if that's all there is, um, that's absolutely right. But that's um, not all there is. That's not all there is. Yeah, there, there are a couple other things worth worth mentioning. Um, the second is uh, what I like to call the professionalization of the investment business. And if you if you if you think about all holders of equity in in a given market, um, some are going to be above average, some are going to be below average. There's no source of outperformance for the outperformers other than the underperformance of the underperformers. It's 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 a zero sum game in that in that sense. So if you're in an environment, uh, like, for example, in the 1950s, maybe in the U.S., if you're in an environment where the professional investment managers only control a minority of the assets, it's theoretically possible for a majority, maybe even all, although that's that's a bit of a stretch, but it's theoretically possible for a majority of the professionals to outperform the market because they are trading with 
what I like to call undiversified amateurs, you know, people who don't have the same skill level they do, the same sources of information, uh, the same trading efficiencies and, and so forth. Uh, but what happens when the investment business becomes largely professionalized, as it did in, in the 60s and early 70s in the U.S., then the average, the, the professionals are trading against each other. And so why is it why is it generally the case that the majority of active managers don't outperform the market? It's because they're trading with one another. They are the market in, in a sense and oversimplifying uh, oversimplifying a bit. Uh, another way to say that is that if you, you think of uh, a portfolio manager at, say, J.P. Morgan in, in New York, um, in the 1950s, he might have been trading against a, a retail broker in the Midwest. Now he's trading against somebody, let's say, at Fidelity in Boston. They went to the same schools. They have the same Bloomberg terminals. They have the same sources of information. They went to the same CFA program. So there's no sustainable advantage. Um, that's why, uh, parenthetically, uh, at least uh, arguably anyway, that indexing started in the 1970s, uh, not, 50, not 20 years sooner, not 20 years later, because by the 1970s, the U.S. market had become almost entirely professionalized or largely so. So that, that's the second reason. Mm -hmm. the, the third reason that I that is less well understood, uh, but is also important, is that in most uh, in most years, equity returns are, are statistically what I would call skewed. I mean, we all know what a bell curve looks like, symmetrical around the average. Stock returns don't look like that. And you might suspect that's the case because the stock can only go down 100 percent. It can go up 100, 200, 300. So there's this natural uh, a statistician would call it positive skewness or right skewness, natural right skewness built in. Um, what that means is most of the time, the average stock in a given market does better than the median. In other words, the one in the middle. Now that's very common. If we had a if we had a room full of people, we took heights and weights. I guarantee you, the average is better than the, than the median. Um, it's very, very common, but it happens with stock returns most of the time, too. What that means is that if an I, and I would have thought before thinking about skewness, that if an active manager can identify stocks in the upper half of the distribution, he'll do well over time. But in fact, that's not good enough because the distribution, the average return of the distribution is dragged upward, uh, you typically by some really big performers and only a minority of stocks actually outperform the index. Uh, over 20 years, it's something like 25% of the stocks under outperform the index. So the selection process is much, much harder uh, than you might otherwise think. Sure. But it, the bell curve relates to longer term averages, correct? Um, the bell, well, the, the point about skewness is it, it, it happens most single years. You see it overwhelmingly if you look at 10 or 20 years of data. Um, it's not, it's not, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's it's correct to think of single years as being skewed most of the time, but the effect is much more dramatic when you compound it over long periods of time. Sure. So it, the the odds, the statistics are really in the investor's favor who is going with the consistency of an index fund product, correct? A absolutely. The thing I always say about, you know, we don't, we're index providers. We don't give investment advice. But the, the, as far as I could go is to say, if you're going to choose active management, realize the odds are against you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time, Craig. Thank you, Murray. Pleasure to be here.